81, Article 81 of the Mental Hygiene Law, known to us in the biz as Article 81. It allows for the appointment of a guardian based on clear and convincing evidence. You must demonstrate to have the appointment of a guardian that the person is in need of a guardian for either personal care or for management of property. So there are two kinds of guardians, personal needs guardian and property management guardian. When you do your petition, you have to ask for one or both, and you have to give the reasons why. There are also special guardians for a limited purpose. Let's say you've got this individual who is not capable of managing the sale of their $3 million landmark home on the Upper East Side. The court could appoint a guardian for the limited and specific purpose of that sale, assisting with that sale or creating a trust for a specific purpose. Time limited, specific to a particular need. Temporary guardian, we talked about someone in a coma. 50 years old, you're in a coma, your plane goes down, you're burned over 80% of your body, you can't speak for yourself, you haven't done, silly you, your health care proxy, your living will, and you're not married. And you haven't done a power of attorney. You need a guardian. A guardian can be appointed for you for the period of time that you are in a coma. If you come out of it, then there's a proceeding to have it removed. Temporary guardianship. Article 83, talk about it very little at the end, but this is new, and thank goodness, particularly for those of you who are in the trust and estates um, and uh, tax and um, real estate, because it allows guardianship to be recognized in New York where there are out of state, uh, the original guardianship was created in another state. With me so far? Okay. Now, I've managed to get everyone very excited. I can just see by the looks on your face. Article 81 guardianship is a last resort. It is to be used only when there are no other means available or the other means available are inadequate to meet the needs of the allegedly incapacitated person. Now, what did I say about plenary guardianships a minute ago? What's a plenary guardianship? Use all rights. This is a civil rights issue. This is why the burden is so high that it must be clear and convincing evidence. Article 81 recognizes the constitutional responsibility of due process. 17A does not. Guardianships are tough to fight. It's tough to meet that burden. And they are expensive. They're very expensive to litigate because the burden is so high and they can be very, very contentious. It is a daunting thing to ask a judge or a jury. I'm gonna go back to the program we had before this when we talked about capacity. Who determines capacity? A doctor? No. An attorney? No. We can assess capacity for legal purposes. But the final determination about someone's capacity is made by a judge or by a jury. There's a right to a jury trial. 
So if you have somebody in your office who you are afraid is maybe not quite all there, don't worry. Your duty is to assess, not to determine. That's come to part two when we'll go all over capacity again. This is a matter of civil rights. Article 81 takes away civil rights. But I love them. Because as difficult as a process as it is, it is respectful of the basics of the US Constitution of due process. The AIP has a right to be represented by counsel, right to be present at the hearing, and the determination by the judge or jury must be the least restrictive and as a last resort. How many people have, here have a power of attorney themselves and a statutory gift writer? Done before, done after 2010? You yeah, better make sure if you didn't do it that you redo it because the law changed in 2009 and 10. So your old ones we could drive a truck through. What about um, a healthcare proxy and living will? There is in place now a statute that will say who will speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. But what if it's your son who's the first person that they're going to ask. And you think he's gonna pull the plug and you don't want the plug pulled. So better you should decide by yourself. Guardianship has been called civil death. How do you avoid it? You get your documents in place before they are needed. What are some of the other things you can use? Supplemental needs trusts, joint accounts, Make sure that you do your research about the difference between a joint account and a convenience account. Community resources, SAM, nursing, uh, money managers, accountants, and mediation to try and help families work through the issues. I have a client in a nursing home now in Maine who we caught in the nick of time. She was one, began wandering around New York, very wealthy. You wouldn't have known it. Never wanted to leave the city of New York. Where is she now? She's in a nursing home in Maine, and she still thinks she's in New York. She's very happy. She's in an Alzheimer's ward in a nursing home there because we got in in time while she still had enough competence to do a power of attorney and healthcare proxies. Had she not, she would have been subject to the court to the uh, imposition of an Article 81 guardianship. We talked a little bit about this. It's desirable, this is what the um, prelude to Article 81. <clears throat> and beneficial for a person with incapacities to make available to them the least restrictive form of intervention to assist them in meeting their needs, but at the same time permit them self-determination to the extent they're capable. Every guardianship has to be tailored to the needs of the individual. How do you tailor that? You talk about the functional level of the individual and their limitations. Management of daily living. Um, what are, do, is everyone here familiar with what ADLs are? Activities of daily living? Who got up and got dressed this morning? Who's like, you know, trying really hard to hold in the fact that this is the Christmas season. Come on, let's get, you know, who got dressed this morning? All right, who brushed their teeth? Okay. Who had to help somebody else do it this morning? I don't care, it could have been a five-year-old. 
the activities of daily living, mobility, eating, toileting, dressing, those are the activities of daily living. Money management. The, many people can sign a check, but do they know what they're signing? Are they giving away millions to the Jamaican lottery? Functional limitations and functional level is what the judge is going to look for. Clear and convincing evidence, we talked about. The standard is extremely high, as I said. I'd love to give, read you a case, a little bit about a case. Matter of Tate. It's a, from 1994, and it's a great example of where a judge decided, and I quote, Justice Solomon considered the functional limitations of the alleged capacitated person. What, if anything, an appointed guardian would be able to accomplish for this alleged incapacitated person? Point of order, point of fact. When you bring a guardianship petition, the individual who is named as the person in need of a guardian is the alleged incapacitated person. Once the decision is made that they are, in fact, they're incapacitated, some people don't like it when you say that, but I still use that terminology, to be found in the need of appointment of a guardian sounds a little bit long to me. The incapacitated person, you're the IP, incapacitated person. For this alleged incapacitated person with a mental illness, and after determining that because the alleged incapacitated person in all likelihood would not cooperate with the guardian, decided that the appointment of a guardian in this instance would not be beneficial and would serve no beneficial purpose. Justice Solomon begins her opinion by stating that Ms. Tate is undoubtedly a mentally ill woman, recently widowed at age 63. Living in an SRO, spending her days wandering the streets of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, dressed in layered eccentric garb. However, Justice Solomon determined that perhaps the more appropriate concern or question is not whether she's incapacitated, but whether Article 81 is the vehicle to use to assist the mentally ill. In this case, the court decided appointing a guardian wasn't going to help. This woman was never going to cooperate. So one of the few cases that has been reported that she was allowed, quote, to continue her daily bizarre and eccentric activities, which result from her mental illness without the intervention of an Article 81. What happens is, I call them sentinel events. Someone gets to a point where they are going to harm themselves or harm somebody else. At that point, that's where the guardianship comes in, adult protective services or the family, and uh, you can usually get them into a guardianship. Now, these are a couple of uh, examples of things that have come out of my practice. A uh, 40-year-old professional severely injured in a boating accident in a coma, temporary guardianship. 80-year-old widower paying hundreds of thousands of dollars into the Jamaican lottery. This man had no reason to doubt that this lottery scam was real. He turned against his family, he turned against his friends, and he turned against his church. He was so suckered in by these people. And we brought a guardianship on his behalf. 27 year old with an IQ of 30 inherits stock from a deceased father. You create a, a guardianship for the particular purpose. Dad died, didn't realize that he should have put the money into a special needs trust. If this now 30-year-old with an IQ of 30 
has access to the money, which she does because she's inherited it outright, she's going to lose all her benefits. But it's not enough money for her to live on. So a S Article 81 petition is brought for the limited purpose of creating a special needs guardian, sorry, for special needs trust into which to deposit these funds. Comatose patient we talked about, and the hoarder in a dispute with the landlord who hasn't paid their rent for six months. I wish I could say that it, there's always going to be helpful uh, appointing a guardian, but what is it? What happens when you bring somebody to court? You begin to rally the social services around them. Geriatric care managers, money managers, social workers, nurses, doctors. The court will insist that those resources be brought to bear to assist this person. What does this matter to me as a lawyer? Because I am only a lawyer. I cannot practice outside of the scope of my practice as authorized under the Code of Ethics. I, my heart may go out to somebody, or I may want to slam this person because they have just pulled off a major uh, con against a commercial real estate developer or a commercial client. But I am only the lawyer. I can pull the evidence together. I can help. I can present the case, but you really need a team of people to work with you to bring that case.